Hello and welcome to your video on carbon and sequestration. So looking at the effects of our building materials and what are maybe some things that we can do about that. So uh, this is a familiar plot. We've seen this where we've looked at the embodied energy that exists in our materials and we saw that softwood lumber versus plywood, we had a lot more energy in plywood and we actually quite high numbers in plywood. Um, in fact, uh, close to recycled steel, the big difference being steel weighs more than 12 times pounds per cubic foot than our wood, and this is an energy per kilogram. So again, don't let these numbers trick you. Our recycled steel being much more environmentally conscious than our virgin steel, which requires more energy, and of course than the pulling of um, pig iron out of the ground. We also saw our cast in place concrete doesn't look so bad until we remember how much concrete weighs, but our cement was almost pound for pound um, CO2 per pound of cement and it's very high in its megajoules per kilogram. An interesting thing to look at on this plot though is our traditional building materials, our baled straw, our adobe, and our bamboo all have very minimal embodied energy per kilogram and that's exciting and a reason to look at these non-conventional building materials. We also saw, and this is the first video of the class, um, our carbon that's admitted in the production of materials and we saw concrete and framing lumber kind of close in their carbon per kilogram but then again we have to compare the actual weights of the materials and concrete is about five times heavier than framing lumber per cubic foot and then of course our cement production which we'd already said was almost pound for pound of co2 per kilogram of material a one-to-one -one ratio and steel also quite high and incredibly high for virgin steel. Now, one of the things that is really interesting is when we look at our framing lumber and our medium density fiberboard, which we now know from studying wood is basically sawdust chips glued up together, we actually see that if we include not only emissions but carbon storage, we start getting these negative numbers for our um, amount of kilograms equivalent of CO2 that's admitted in the atmosphere, we're getting negative numbers. So how is that happening? And what's happening there is that the wood has the ability to sequester carbon or go through carbon sequestration. Now what that means is that it's storing carbon. Now forests are probably the greatest carbon sequestration systems that we have in the world, but the ocean is a huge carbon sink. Um, but if we get too much carbon, people have talked about just injecting carbon into the ocean, but that can actually then change your acidification. You can get algae blooms. You can get what we're getting in areas where you have huge jellyfish blooms happening. So it can change the structure of the ocean, so it's not necessarily a great solution. The soil is also a big carbon storer as well, and other greenhouse gases, and it can be a problem, say, up in the tundra, which now that it's thawing in places, it's a huge problem because huge amounts of methane are being released. But what we have here is a plot of just how well carbon does in trees or trees sequestering. And so this is a chart for dug fir trees based on how many tons of carbon you can store um, per hectare of land. And so on the bottom axis is the age of the Douglas fir tree in decades. So we can see in our first 30 years of growth, we're getting very, very, very little limited to no carbon storage. And that's kind of disappointing when we realize our managed forests are often cutting the trees down as young as 30 years old. And so we're, even though it might say this is a managed forest and you're thinking you're getting green lumber and you're going to be sequestering carbon, you're sequestering very, very little carbon and have lost this huge advantage because dug firs are a very fast growing tree that can sequester a lot of carbon. And during the 30 to 70 years is when we get our greatest rate of carbon sequestration. And the deal though is once the tree hits about 80 years old, it stops sequestering carbon. It actually has reached a saturation point where it can't store any more carbon. And so that red dash line that we see is like, okay, that's the peak amount. That's how many um, tons of carbon we are now storing and we're not going to store any more 
in that hectare of land if it's filled with dug firs that are 80 years old or more. But we can see that peak growth. So if we can start cutting our trees down at 70 or 80 years old instead of 30 years old, look at how much carbon carbon could be in the wood and trapped in the wood that then goes into the walls of the home, the doors, the flooring, etc. That would be amazing. Now the way the numbers look per the EPA, if we had a very fast growing dug fir, you might be sequestering as much as 92-ish pounds of carbon per year per tree. Remember the plot on the right is uh, per a section of land, so carbon tons, metric tons per hectare. So this is in one tree, we might expect about 92 pounds. A medium rate conifer is about half of that. Slow growing conifers, we're gonna get less, um, much less at about 20 pounds of carbon per year. Now, if you planted hardwoods, you can expect about 25% higher numbers for each of those categories of fast, medium, and slow growing trees. And that's why in the rainforests around Brazil, it's such a concern when they get cut down because they're just such great sequestering tools. It's much more impactful when that forest is cut down than a forest is cut down in middle America of slow growing conifers. It's also why you will see um, it's a great place for people who want to actually do carbon offset programs. In fact, a friend of mine whose family runs a travel business, they feel really bad about the carbon offset of flying to places or if you're on a ship and the amount that goes out on the ships. And so they encourage all of their clients to buy carbon offsets from places that will actually plant trees to offset your usage. And because there are some amazing hardwoods that are very popular, say in Latin America, down in Southern America, they actually have created their own nonprofit, which is where I buy my carbon offsets from, the Carbon Tree Fund, and they pay locals to actually plant and manage and healthily manage a hardwood forest, and they can then cut down the trees. And these were in places where trees were initially being illegally cut down because of poverty. Folks could get a lot of money for the tree. Now they're gainfully employed in this system where the trees are cut down at a manageable rate and more trees are being planted regularly. And I can pay to pay that salary of those people to do that and offset my carbon usage. So it's a pretty cool system. Now, in the U.S., the Environmental Protection Agency has actually gone through and looked at the, all the different types of trees in the U.S., the rates at which they grow, um, the age of the trees, etc., and has estimated that on average in the United States, if we looked at our tree coverage for the whole country, we can assume we get about 26.6 pounds of carbon per tree. So that's our established rate. And in fact, on the handout that you have that goes with this module, you'll actually see um, a link to a calculator where you can get sequestration rates for different trees or different coverage. It's just kind of cool. Now, people do talk about, I mean, if I can buy trees to be planted to offset my travel, can we plant our way out of the greenhouse gas issue that we have and global warming? The answer is probably no in a big way, but let's kind of look at why. So let's just talk about annual CO2 emissions per car in the United States. And of course we have different types of cars. We have our incredibly eco-friendly cars like they're in the upper right, and then our much less so in the bottom. And in 2017, it was determined that of all the cars on the road in the United States, we averaged about 22.3 miles per gallon, which is really basically a Subaru. Um, and that the average driver was driving, this is phenomenal to me, 13 and a half thousand miles. I drive about three and a half thousand miles, but that's cool. All right, so gallons of gas per year then, per person, and you end up with about 604.3 gallons of gas per driver. Now, it turns out that each gallon of gas admits about... 00892 metric tons of carbon dioxide. So that means that each person is admitting, each driver is admitting about 5.39 metric tons of CO2. Now, metric tons isn't necessarily a number we're familiar with, so we convert metric tons to pounds. And when we do that, we see it's just under 12 thousand pounds of carbon per driver per year in the United States. 
If we know that trees can offset that, can we figure out then how many trees we need to offset almost 1,200 pounds of carbon per year per driver? We could say per car, but some people have two cars, so per driver. All right, and just to help out some conversion factors, and if you have these in your notes, um, obviously a, a US ton is 2,000 pounds. A metric ton, which is the NNE ton, is 2,404, if we're precise, it's a kilogram. Uh, sometimes you're gonna see a teragram on things, and so just know that it is a million metric tons. But now here's a critical one, and this is in, in homework and, and on exams, this is one that gets students. Um, carbon and CO2 are not the same thing, and CO2 is gonna weigh more than carbon. So 12 pounds of carbon is 44 pounds of CO2. All right, so let's go back and now see about our tree. So we had our Subaru of 22.3 miles per gallon. That's their cypress color, that's my car. And then you have your average driver, huh, this 13 and a half thousand uh, miles. And let's think about our Doug fir. So we've already established this almost 1200 pounds. If we went with a 45 year old grow, fast growing Doug fir and said, hey, we're gonna get almost that 92 pounds of carbon sequestration, well, we have to convert our CO2 to carbon that's up in our gas. And so we'd have our 11,880 pounds of CO2. We're gonna multiply that by 12 pounds of carbon, divide that by 44 pounds of CO2 to convert that to carbon, and then say, okay, we're gonna get a, you know, our 91.8 pounds of carbon per tree. We're gonna end up with needing about 35 trees. It's 34 and change, but you can't cut down or plant half a tree. So 35 it is. Um, for the average U.S. tree, if we use that 26.6, because not everybody's going to plant a Doug fir, it's going to take 122 trees. So now stop and reflect. If every driver in the U.S. tried to plant 122 trees a year, because that's what it's going to take based on all the types of trees that might grow in different areas, is there even space for that every year? Probably not, all right? But if we are managing our forests, perhaps some of that sequestered carbon, especially if we can get trees that are a little older than 30 years old, that sequestered carbon could be stored in our wood products and then give us more space to plant. So maybe managed forests, if done properly, are not a bad idea. In fact, they're not. Um, but so let's see what that looks like and to really understand how much wood comes out of a tree or to understand, we do need to understand the concept of a board foot. So wood is sold in bulk using a measurement of a board foot where a board foot is 12 inches by 12 inches by one inch thick or one foot squared by one inch thick. This is sort of your generic term for it. But here are three different things that could be a board foot because if we are talking 12 inch by 12 inch by one inch, it's really 144 cubic inches. So the generic piece, that 12 inch by 12 inch by one inch thick there on the left, that's pretty typical. But if you had something that was 12 inches and only six inches wide, then if it was two inches thick, it's still a board foot. That's still 144 cubic inches. And then we have our last board, which is three inches by three inches, so nine square inches by 16 inches long. That's also gonna give us our 144 cubic inches. And so we have all of these being a board foot. So let's see what that means for us lumber wise. So let's say we needed a thousand square feet of five eighths inch thick wood panel, like some sort of plywood. I mean, if you have a thousand square foot single story house and you're just putting down a subfloor, hopefully you're using at least five eighths, if not three quarter inch thick plywood. But this would be, if we have a thousand square feet that's five eighths inch thick, then we just take our thousand times five eighths and we have 625 board feet because we would have the units of foot squared by inches. How many trees do we need? <laughs> to get 625 board feet. How many board feet can you get out of a tree? Well, obviously it depends on the size of a tree. There's no going around that. Um, to find the volume of a tree, and then we can convert our volume units so that it's board feet, 
To find the volume of a tree, you actually just take the cross-sectional area. So here I have the diameter squared times pi divided by four. So that's just the area of the tree. But you don't just multiply it by its height. You would multiply it by its height divided by four, especially when we're talking about conifers because they taper. And just for fun, where do you think they measure the diameter? Is that the diameter at the base? Turns out they measure the diameter four feet off the ground. Why four feet off the ground? Stop and think about the uh, average height of a man about 100 years ago and hug your tree. Where are your arms going to be? Don't want to make these gentlemen squat. All right, so this is how we find, though, our uh, volume of a tree. So let's say we have a 10-inch diameter tree, which is a little large for a managed forest, but not too far off the base and say it was 40 feet tall, I'm going to take my 10 inches and convert that to feet just so that I'm starting off in foot cubes because I don't want inches cubed by feet or inches squared by feet. That would be weird. So um, I end up with 5.45 feet cubed of wood per tree. That's my volume. And then I just multiply that by one 12 inches per foot to change my units to feet squared by inches. And I end up with 65.4 board feet. So I basically need about 10 trees to get just the flooring, perhaps like the subfloor for a thousand square foot timber framed house. And again, I would say three quarter inch is better than five eighths on your flooring. All right. So what does that mean though for if this is if this is about 10 trees just for the plywood that goes on the floor, how much do we need in an entire house? And you've got a homework assignment that's going to build off of this. So the Idaho Forest Products Commission's looked at a 2000 square foot house for a single family home. And they figured you needed just over 13,000 or board feet of just framing lumber. Then they said you needed another 10,900 square feet of um, other wood products. So a bunch of that, about 6,000 square feet of that was sheathing. So that's your sheathing is plywood. It's a different term for it. So that's on your walls, your floors, your roofs. That could be the oriented strand board or plywood. And then other wood product. And so if you converted to that 10,900 square feet, assuming that you had about 5 eighths inch thickness on your sheathing, that works out to be about 6,810 board feet of lumber. So for a 2,000 square foot house, if we combine the sheathing lumber board foots with the lumber board foot, we're going to end up needing about 19,940, so about 20,000 board feet of lumber, right? And going back, if one tree has about 65 board feet of lumber, then a 2,000 square foot house needs almost 307 trees, which is almost two acres if we're talking about optimum density of a managed forest of Douglas fir. Now, if it is Doug fir and it's more than 45 years old and we're sequestering around 91 pounds of carbon uh, for every tree each year, we could at least say, you know, gosh, maybe we have 90 pounds of carbon. And so with 300 trees, we might be getting 27,000 pounds of carbon stored in our house. So that's kind of cool. All right. So the nice thing is, is say you have a 2,500 square foot house, you can just take these numbers and scale it as far as the board feet of lumber. So that's really handy. So we hope you're starting to get an idea as you watch these videos of what um, carbon sequestration is 